Hey man, are you ready yet? We're gonna start. Bro, where are your clothes? W what What do you mean? In the script, it said we were talking about exposing yourself. That's That's not what. No, no, we're not talking about exposing yourself. We're talking about the exposure triangle. You no, know, exposing photos by your yourself. Not whatever this is. Oh. Oh, so I should probably put some clothes yeah. in. Yeah. 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 All right, let's try this a second time. Oh. Nothing like warm tap water. Hello, my name is Nick, and I am excited, very excited, to talk to you about the sacred exposure triangle. I've been waiting to do this video since before I realized that transition lenses aren't cool. But more exciting than that is a new video series we're working on here at Black Bar. And this, this is the first episode. We recognize that a lot of our viewers work with volunteers and we want to create content that you can use to train those volunteers. We also know that a lot of you are using different systems and equipment to do what you do. For goodness sake, the number of different preferred cameras is enough to spark a debate on our video channel on our Discord. Hashtag Sony for life. Quick plug, if you're not on the Discord channel, check out the link in the description. Anyway, it would be pointless for us to try to create a video on how to use every camera or every lighting board or every microphone. Instead, we wanna give you enough to be dangerous. What I mean by this is that your volunteers will have enough information to pick up a camera and know where they could start using it with some direction from you. We'll teach them the basics and you can give them the specifics. Sound good? All right. Let's get into the first episode of Enough to be Dangerous. The exposure triangle. What is it? Moreover, why should you care? A good understanding of exposure triangle will allow you to use your camera settings to its fullest extent. This will give you control over the creativity of your photos. For the church media person, it means being able to take better photos more intentionally. You can still take great photos using your auto exposure settings, but your camera will be making those creative choices for you. Your camera is pretty smart, but it's not smarter than you. For the purposes of today, we're gonna to be focusing on mostly using DSLR cameras. You can access some of these settings on your camera phone, but I think we'll save that for another video. And we'll also assume that you're planning on using your camera on manual. I know there are a lot of settings that cameras have, but they can differ from brand to brand. And understanding the exposure triangle should also give you a better understanding on how to use these settings to their fullest extent. All right. Let's talk about the Holy Trinity. And no, I don't mean the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the ISO, the shutter speed, and the Holy Aperture. Together, these elements control how bright or how dark your photos are. In other words, exposure. But we're not talking about the exposure we experienced in the beginning of this video. Please, let's just, I don't, I don't wanna relive that again. You'll find that in terms of exposure settings, there isn't just one setting that's right. There are a few options for every scenario and every scenario will require different settings. So let's start with ISO. Before the digital age, photos were captured with film. You would put something like this into a camera like this. The film would lay across an opening attached to the lens. The chemicals on the film would react to a light, essentially burning the image into the film strip. Now, I actually have a film strip from uh, when I was in college um, and, and for an old college project that I had there. Um, you can kind of see it here. Now, using this projector, we can see what the final product might have looked like. Now, it's probably important to note that your film strip is not the final product. In fact, it would create what's called a negative, and that negative would be used to create your final product. But film comes in all shapes and sizes. Clearly, this is much different than, say, the size of this. They're, they're two different shapes completely. But more importantly, for our understanding of the exposure triangle, it comes in different speeds. What I'm talking about when I say speed isn't necessarily how fast you're, you can take photos over a duration of time. We're talking about the sensitivity of the film. And that sensitivity is measured by its ISO number. A low ISO number or a low speed meant that the film was less sensitive. You would put a 200 ISO film roll into your camera if you expected there to be a lot of light for your photos. On the other hand, a high ISO number like 
2000 might mean that you're expecting low light. This particular uh, strip of film is actually four, uh, 400 ISO. A major problem with film photography is once you put in a film roll, you are stuck using that ISO until you finish the whole roll. Fast forward to the turn of the century and we're no longer using film. Instead, we're using digital cameras and they're using a sensor rather than film to see light. So now ISO isn't the sensitivity of your film, but the sensitivity of your camera's sensor. And what's nice about this is that we can control this setting on the fly. No more waiting until your next roll of film to adjust your ISO. If you're shooting an event at your church where half of it takes place inside and half of it takes place outside, you can keep adjusting your ISO so you don't have to change your other settings. The downside of this is that the higher your ISO goes, the more noise that will be introduced into your picture. Now, Caleb had a really great explanation of what noise is in his video, Five Advanced Photo Editing Tips for church photography. So let's uh, let's take a second, let's take a listen to Caleb. Number five, turn down the drive. When your camera sensor doesn't get enough light to accurately interpret the colors it's seeing, it takes its best guess on a per pixel basis. The inconsistency of these guesses leads to what we call noise. Some noise is good, a lot of noise is bad. It's easy to add noise to a photo, but how can you remove it without losing detail? If you've got the cash to blow, neat image is a miracle. So if you're interested, you can watch that video in its entirety uh, by looking at the link over here. ISO, it controls the sensitivity of your sensor. The higher it goes, the more noise your photo will have. Let's move on to the next setting, shutter speed. In our previous exploration of ISO, you may have pondered how do I control how long the sensor is exposed to light, or is it just exposed all the time? The answer to that is kind of yes, depending on your type of camera. Film cameras are old, mostly operate using a mirror. Light would travel through your lens and then to your film, but how would you see what you're shooting? Cleverly, a mirror was added that would reflect the light from your lens up into the viewfinder so you could see through and see what you're shooting. When the button was pressed, the mirror would flip up and move out of the way. A mechanical shutter would then reveal your film, exposing it for a certain amount of time. Here, we'll, we'll take a look what that looks like right now. Ready? There you go. Time passed and we started using DSLRs like this Canon 5D that my wife uses for her photography business. We still use the mirror, but things started to change. Camera manufacturers realized that a mechanical shutter wasn't necessary. The sensor itself could act as a shutter allowing light to be received for a certain duration of time. And after a while they thought, well, why even have the mirror at all? Why not just feed it through the sensor to the digital viewfinder? That's what led to mirrorless cameras like my A7 III from Sony, again. Sony for life. So why all this history? Well, depending on your type of camera you're using will determine if you have a mechanical shutter or an electronic shutter, or both. I mention this really because I appreciate having a silent shutter when shooting during church services, especially when my pastor's preaching and it's really quiet. It doesn't draw a lot of attention to me, and better yet, I'm not as much a distraction to those trying to hear the sermon. Regardless of a mechanical or electronic shutter, they do the same thing. They control how long your sensor is exposed to light. And generally speaking, they're measured in fractions of a second. For example, one two hundredth of a second, or the more extreme one four thousandth of a second. Most cameras will either display your shutter speed as a fraction or just the denominator. So instead of one over 200, we'll just say 200. Personally, I prefer this method because I feel like it takes a long time to say one over 200 instead of just 200. It's important to know that the longer your shutter is open, the more light your sensor will receive. So a lower denominator or lower number will give you a brighter image. But here's the catch. If what you're shooting moves faster than your shutter, you're going to end up with motion blur. And trust me, you have to crank your shutter pretty high before you start removing all motion blur. Motion blur kind of looks like this. It can be used to great effect. Have you ever seen a photo of a river where the water just looks smooth? This is done by having a very low shutter speed. On the other hand, a high shutter speed can make the water look crisp and sharp, almost frozen in time. However, for most of your shoots in the church world, you're probably gonna prefer having a higher shutter speed. At this point, you might be wondering, well, why not just keep the shutter speed really high all the time? Well, that would be great. 
if your scene has a lot of light. If your church sanctuary is like most church sanctuaries that I've shot in, they're pretty dark. And though cranking your ISO really high to get a higher shutter speed is possible, I wouldn't recommend it. Again, you'll end up with a lot of noise. If your goal is to eliminate motion blur from a human subject, you're going to want to stay somewhere between a shutter speed of 125 and 1000. 125 to about 150 will stop motion blur for a person walking at a normal pace. Meanwhile, 500 to 1000 should stop motion blur for a person running. Depending on your denomination, we'll probably determine which one of these you're going to use. Shutter speed. It controls how long your sensor is exposed to light. The higher it goes, the less light it receives, and the less motion blur you'll have. Now, let's move on to our next setting, aperture. The aperture isn't on your camera, it's on the lens. Inside most camera lenses are blades that rotate. You can actually see this inside here of this 85 broken on lens. I'm gonna let you see how they rotate as I move them. Pretty cool. As they rotate together, they control the size of the opening to your lens. This opening controls not only the amount of light, but the shape of the light that hits your sensor. But more on that in a little bit. Aperture isn't unlike your eye. When you enter a dark room, your pupil grows large, allowing for more light to enter your eye so you can see in the dark. But if you were to walk out of that room and step outside on a sunny day, your pupils would shrink to restrict the amount of light that could enter your eye. We measure this opening on our camera lenses by something called f-stops, or just stops for short. When you look at your aperture settings, you'll either see a number, or you might see something that looks like this. That might look a little funny, but what you're seeing is actually a representation of a fraction. Are you ready for some algebra? Well, not really. We're just going to stall for f. Okay, well, no, we're, no, we're not, we're, we're not. I'm just gonna tell you what it is. The F in this instance stands for focal length. For simplicity's sake, we can think of focal length as similar to magnification. For most of our black bar videos, including this one that we're creating right now, we use a 24 millimeter lens. My a7 III currently has a 50 millimeter lens on it, and uh, what we just used earlier, this is an 85 millimeter lens. The higher the number, the greater the magnification. For this example, let's use my 50 millimeter lens on my camera and let's say that the aperture is set to f2. If we substitute the focal length with the letter f, so 50, we'll see that we can actually solve this fraction. 50 over 2 is 25, or in this case, 25 millimeters. So the size of the hole created by the blades should be about 25 millimeters wide. If I stop down to f22, the math tells us that the size is now a little bit more than two millimeters. This makes sense, uh, as you can see visually, as uh, I open up this iris again, so you can see right there. Right now, this is set about 1. Point, uh, what are we at? 1.5. Pretty open on the 85 millimeter here. If I were to put it at f22, like we said before, um, the hole in the lens is is tiny. It's super small. Now, if we do the math here again, 85 over 22. It's about three, a little bit less than four, 3.86. Let's talk about when I said it controls the shape of the light. Did you happen to watch the episode where Caleb talked about lighting? Caleb has a great illustration where he shows the relative size of a light source and how it affects the sharpness of a shadow. The same principle can be applied here. When an aperture is wide open, you'll receive light from a lot of different angles. This doesn't make your image out of focus, but it does adjust the depth of field. Depth of field is essentially how much of your image will be in focus. I've, I've heard it described like this. Imagine a pane of glass that clips through your subject. Anything that touches the pane of glass will be in focus. How wide this glass is, is determined by your aperture. A low aperture will result in a thin pane of glass, or what we call shallow depth of field. A higher aperture will make it wider, allowing for much more of the image to be in focus. Now, what's important to note is that in reality, depth of field isn't as clear cut as a pane of glass and the, the edges of it are not, this is what's in focus up to here, and then everything outside of that is out of focus. It's more of a gradient. So don't expect your depth of field to be sharp and then just suddenly drop off. That's not how it works. Using a shallow depth of field is great for making your photos look more lifelike. It can help you separate your subject from the background and give your images more depth. In fact, it, it mimics the eye. Try this. 
Put your hand about a foot in front of your face and focus on your fingers. Without moving your gaze, observe what is behind your fingers. Note that it's out of focus. Our eyes don't see everything in focus all at once. There is in fact a lot that is out of focus. Using a low aperture can help simulate this in our photos. However, that doesn't mean using a high aperture is bad. When shooting buildings or landscapes, it's better to have more in focus. It really depends on what you're shooting and what you want your intended audience to see. Aperture. It controls how much light hits the sensor by controlling the opening in the lens. The higher it goes, the less light you'll have, and the deeper your depth of field will be. And there you have it, the three parts of the exposure triangle. ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. I know it's a lot of information, so I encourage you to rewatch the video in case you need to hear something again. And if you have access to a DSLR with manual settings, I also encourage you go out and shoot. Put to practice what you've just learned. You've probably heard the cliche a million times, but a picture is worth a thousand words. So go out there and preach the gospel by taking compelling photos. And remember, worship isn't reserved for Sunday mornings. Don't forget to worship while you work. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Black Bar. If you haven't already joined our Discord, Zach, Caleb, and myself are there often, and so are our certified pros, willing and ready to answer your questions and help you out. Also, we have a podcast where we go more in depth into some of the topics we talk about here. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you can see more content, and we'll see you in the next episode.